Good day and welcome to Meet the Leader. In this special two-part episode, we had the privilege of sitting down with the former South African President, Thabo Mbeki. Here is part one of our conversation. Enjoy. Your Excellency, welcome to the Thanks program. Thanks a lot. There is a, a wide belief that uh, family background does influence uh, leadership aspirations and uh, dispositions. Uh, your father, Govani Mbeki, was influential in the uh, African uh, Congress Party, but also on South Africa Communist Party. In fact, at some point, he was arrested by the apartheid uh, regime. To what extent this uh, childhood uh, background and uh, exposure influenced uh, your leadership aspiration and, uh, and skills? Well, I don't know about leadership, but of course the fact that uh, we, we, we grew up in a, in a political family, uh, that meant that uh, we got exposed to uh, this challenge of having to respond to the apartheid system. Um, there wasn't uh, any sort of direct instruction, but I'm saying growing up in that kind of situation, uh, which among other things, you, you learn to, to read a lot because uh, it's that kind of, of, of household. Uh, so the habit of trying to discover, to find out things, uh, to check what is reality, thinking, and all of that, uh, is something that, that, that we were, were brought up with. Uh, but uh, I mean, practically, in a physical sense, we, uh, all of us as children did not grow up with the parents. And the reason for it was because they, uh, they knew that uh, they, they would get arrested and would have to spend a long time in jail. And so they wanted us to grow up uh, in their absence. So from the age of 9, 10, we left home and stayed with relatives and friends and so on. Uh, but I'm saying that the, the, I think the basic thing was that uh, we grew up in a family of that kind, which, which exposes you to, particularly to these things about uh, you have to read, you have got to understand, you've got to analyze, and, and so on and so on, uh, uh, come to some decisions and, and act on them. I think that probably would, would have been the benefit of, of, of growing up in a family like that. Your Excellency, you spent about 28 years in exile, um, attained your university degree in, in Britain, then you went to Soviet for, for guerrilla fighting uh, uh, exposure. You were sent by your party then to Lesotho, Zambia, and other countries to mobilize and uh, organize underground operations. This, this foreign exposure, to what extent they shaped up you were thinking as a leader later on when you assumed the presidency? Well, I would say that uh, <clears throat> the, uh, the fact of all of these years that we spent in exile, uh, as you were saying, moving around, traveling around, one of the things it did was uh, it exposed us to the African experience. Uh, so uh, though we were focused naturally on our own struggle to liberate South Africa, Nevertheless, because we are uh, on the continent, uh, you get exposed to what was happening in Tanzania, uh, what's happening in Nigeria, and, and, and so on. But I think uh, of, of great importance in that context uh, to get exposed to the leaders of the day. Uh, <clears throat> for instance, uh, we, uh, one of the people that we are very fortunate to have to interact with who very were young, uh, but uh, being part of delegations and so on, was, was uh, Mualimu, uh, Julius Nyerere. Uh, you sit in meetings, you listen to him, uh, what he says, uh, how he thinks, how he conducts meetings, and, and all of that. Um, so very, I think, very, very valuable experience for us uh, in terms of what we would then have to do in South Africa later, uh, because we're exposed to the actual practice of political leadership in independent Africa. Uh, plus, of course, exposed to the fact of this enormous solidarity uh, which was extended uh, to us, to our people, uh, indeed uh, Tanzania, Zambia, and so on, these, uh, in a sense, are, are, are second homes. Um, 
So, <clears throat> but I'm saying that uh, the, the, the one of the central points, of course, would be that uh, you have a, a fair amount of knowledge about challenges of government, challenges of political leadership on the continent, and so on. But also, the, uh, uh, in terms of the wider world, uh, <clears throat> the, some familiarity also with, with how the world works, uh, even from the point of view of individual countries. Because uh, you interact with the Swedes, uh, with the Soviet Union, with the United States, uh, with Cuba, with India, and so on. Um, so you get to understand um, how people think, and all that, which helps, again, uh, once you achieve liberation, to say how do we construct our relations with the rest of the world. That, that kind of exposure was, uh, was, was important. Plus, as I was saying, uh, this exposure to this very intense, passionate feeling throughout the continent, among ordinary people, not just governments, uh, South Africa must be free. Uh, this is our problem uh, as Africans. We've got to attend to it together, and uh, people ready to make all sorts of sacrifices, which emphasized point uh, about you know us as as Africans sharing a common destiny, uh, because indeed uh, the destiny of the South African people became the destiny of the African people as a whole. So uh, <clears throat> what it what it what it meant. That, of course, that's when South Africa was liberated, it had to, to bear that in mind, that it also, this liberated South Africa, had a responsibility to the rest of the continent, to work with the rest of the continent as an equal, as an equal to say, look, we, we have this experience of, uh, of African solidarity, which has produced liberation in South Africa. We must uh, sustain that experience of African solidarity. To, to address our common challenges. But as I say, as equals and so on, because uh, indeed, uh, as a liberation movement, as I was saying that we'd, uh, we'd meet, meet with, with Mualimu, and uh, it would not be like uh, one meeting of the president of Tanzania who, who's going to give us instructions and so on. No, just meeting as comrades, let's, this is a common challenge. What do we do? How do we address it together? So I'm saying that that becomes a very important part of how we have to think as a liberated South Africa relative to the rest of our continent. In 1999, you became the second post-apartheid president. At that time, when you assumed the mantle of the presidency, did you have a specific vision of where you wanted to take the country to? Well, I think in our case, you see, we're very fortunate in that, uh, um, let me say, uh, before 94, uh, before we took over as government, uh, as, as the ANC, uh, we had sat down and said, liberation is coming. Uh, what are we going to do with that liberation? What is it that we're going to do? And we're quite confident that once you had uh, democratic elections, the ANC would be elected. So we had to answer the question that once we come into positions of power, what do we do? So, um, <clears throat> We worked on all sorts of policies. Uh, in the end, that was, uh, it became a document which was called the Reconstruction and Development Program, which was a comprehensive program indeed for the reconstruction and development of South Africa. So, uh, so I mean, when I come into the position of president in 1999, that's a framework on which we're working. So it wasn't a matter of uh, any personal vision. We, we had this commonly agreed program um, which had to do with economic transformation, social transformation, and building up of the democratic state institutions, seeing what we do about the security sector, uh, what we do about international relations, all of those things. Uh, so this is what was uh, guiding us. I would say that fundamentally, um, you know that uh, by the time we come into, into government, uh, we'd had uh, three and a half centuries uh, of, of colonialism, um, apartheid and all that. This is three and a half centuries. So you can imagine the impact that that had on South African society. 
So you inherit a, a, a country which has got that three and a half century history uh, of white minority domination, um, which has produced particular consequences. So at the center of that reconstruction and development program is the notion that well, what we've got to do is to eradicate this legacy uh, uh, of colonialism and apartheid uh, in all respects. So that really basically is the vision. Uh, what is it that we do in education, in the economy, in, in everything to eradicate that legacy? And, uh, and that, that really was at the center, and it remains. It remains a challenge uh, in South Africa to this day. Do you think that framework of a strategic uh, vision that uh, you wanted to take was well uh, understood by leaders and general population? I think so, yes. I, I think so. It was well articulated. There had been very, very extensive discussion uh, about it, uh, not only just within the ANC, but even on the broader, uh, with a broader engagement uh, uh, in this. And I think the, uh, because it was so closely related to the reality of South Africa, not difficult to understand, mm -hmm. to say, look, here we are today. Uh, if you take uh, the economy, uh, the majority, the black, the majority of the population, the black majority, for instance, has been excluded from ownership of the economy. This is one of the features, one of the features uh, of, of, this, of this three and a half century old system. Land dispossession, for instance, uh, of the majority. Uh, even blockages in terms of accessing particular professions, uh, particular skills, a system which was called uh, job reservation. Uh, and then so when you say to the population, that's part of what we've inherited, you know it, and of course, yes, we know it. It's part of what we inherited, that's part of what we've got to change. If you say we need a non-racial South Africa, that non-racial South Africa must also be expressed in terms of who owns the economy, what's the form of participation. Is the participation in the economy also non-racial? So that becomes part of your transformation programs. That pump becomes part of the legacy uh, which you, you need to, to eradicate. So I'm saying, no, no, I, the, the, the population indeed would understand, would understand all of that. And in, in, in reflection, when you look back, you think there are some missed opportunities that perhaps uh, uh, your administration could capitalize to fast track some of the areas that perhaps uh, were not well um, uh, attended to uh, during your uh, presidency? Well, yes, I, I think that perhaps the, uh, uh, the, the most, uh, what would, what I, would, I would consider to be a kind of uh, strategic uh, weakness was that we probably, at the point of transformation, at the point of change, I'm talking about 1994-95, at that point of change, we, we might have overestimated the capacity of the white minority to oppose change. We were very concerned that uh, uh, you, you had the, the potential for a rebellion. Uh, among that white population. It's a big population which had been in power for a long time, uh, still controlled uh, in major ways the military, the police, and, and all that, uh, and that we needed to go slowly because uh, if we moved faster, you might get a response, a negative response, that we should avoid this. I'm saying that we, may, we might have overestimated that danger and therefore didn't do certain things that uh, we could have done. For instance, uh, there was a discussion that, uh, among us that perhaps we should have a, a, a short-term, time-limited tax uh, to generate resources that we would need for development. Like a windfall tax? Some, something like yeah. a windfall tax yeah. Uh, yeah. of that nature. Yeah. Uh, 
to generate resources, resources for development, to attend to this problem that we were inheriting a very bad legacy in which the overwhelming majority of the population were uh, disempowered, uh, dispossessed, and all that. But of course, the people who would pay the tax are the people who had the money, which meant the white community. And uh, we didn't do it because uh, of this fear that if you did that, you might indeed be inciting rebellion and resistance from this white community. So maybe we'll come back to the matter later. Let's leave it for now. So we left it. And by the time we thought we could come back to it, uh, the, the moment was lost. So I'm saying that that probably was, uh, in the transition, the biggest, the biggest uh, 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 mistake that we made. The, uh, um, with regard to the rest, it may be that, uh, again, we might have overestimated the speed with which we could indeed eradicate that legacy. Uh, it was very entrenched. We knew that. Uh, it had to be addressed. We knew that. But maybe we might have thought that we could, we could move faster in terms of, of doing that than, than was actually possible. Your Excellency, when you assumed the president, there were these, if, if I may call it, big shoes left behind by your uh, predecessor, Mandiba, uh, President Nelson Mandela, and um, who was actually hailed as a person who united South Africa and took them through post-apartheid and uh, held the country to what is now famous known as a rainbow nation, a country which is democratic, has tolerance, and actually the government wanted to bring about equality and success to people. When, when you look back at the time you assumed the president with this leaguers of, of Mandiba, Mandela leaving the seat to you, did it exert extra pressure on you and how did it shape your focus and approach when you assumed the mantle of the presidency? Well, uh, no, it is true. I mean, it's true that, uh, that Nelson Mandela uh, played a very critical, very important role uh, uh, in terms of that transition. Uh, but of course, he, uh, he belonged among a group of uh, 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 leaders. These are the leaders, really, who had taken us from the 1940s uh, in terms of the struggle. Uh, so uh, so I'm, you didn't have uh, just a, a, a Nelson Mandela. I'm saying that you had the leadership core there. Uh, which had taken us through the, these years of struggle to this point when the, the, the victory is achieved and uh, the new is being established. Which meant that, uh, in, in fact, there was, uh, I'm coming back to what we were discussing earlier, uh, there was a policy framework. Uh, you see, if you take this matter, for instance, of, uh, of national reconciliation, uh, it's a matter which was uh, very fundamental in terms of the thinking of the ANC. That given our history and given where we want to be tomorrow, you can't avoid And given the uh, this history of racism and the, the demographics of, of South Africa, you had to address this issue of, of, of national reconciliation. And I'm saying that obviously in this respect, Nelson Mandela played a very outstanding role but it was, in fact, common policy. So that's what made it easy. So uh, when I succeeded in 1999 uh, and say we must continue to work, we're continuing to work on policies that had been agreed with Nelson Mandela there. So it wasn't a matter of uh, here, here is this big man with uh, big shoes. Uh, now what is it that we're going to do? All we needed to say was, uh, indeed, here is his big man, here's the big shoes. This is uh, what has happened. We must continue with that tradition. We must continue from where he left off. So uh, we didn't have to, to think afresh uh, in terms of what needed to be done in order to respond to the challenges of the country. Uh, and that was an advantage. That was an advantage because indeed, uh, uh, had you had a different situation, had you had a different situation of uh, uh, 
policies that could be attributed exclusively uh, uh, to somebody like him, as important as he is, uh, it would then have been difficult. But I'm saying that we indeed had to inherit it, policies that were existing, and really all we needed to do was to make sure that we continue in terms of the implementation of those policies. Your Excellency, some critics um, argued that um, during your term, the fruits of a um, hard-fought struggle of apartheid actually were not shared equally among the population. The critics uh, proposed rather a few section of um, ruling elites within ANC actually got more favors, uh, right to the exclusion of masses in terms of um, decent housing in township, decent jobs, and uh, availability of health facilities. Uh, were there some expectation management perhaps that uh, they did not see, that perhaps uh, you were trying to, to, to manage at that time, and you may want to share with that as a leadership lesson? No, I think the, uh, <clears throat> a, a criticism of that kind would be wrong. Uh, there, there's nobody who could produce any factual evidence to sustain it, because the reality was, was different. You see, for instance, we, uh, uh, you mentioned the housing issue. Uh, here is a problem, and here is a history of it, uh, of uh, African people, particularly in the urban areas because of previous policies which essentially sought to, to say that the Africans are temporary visitors in the urban areas. Uh, so you have an enormous housing backlog uh, which developed. So we said we've got to address this matter. And indeed went very vigorously at it uh, in terms of addressing that housing shortage as for the ordinary. African people, a very big housing program, uh, which, which continues, or, or, or take um, access to clean water, uh, which is fundamental to health. Uh, we said we've got to address this water problem, uh, both in urban and, and, and rural areas, and uh, again in a very vigorous way, and, and indeed that's what happened. So I'm saying that many interventions of this kind, one of the challenges that uh, uh, we, faced, we faced was uh, you, you had to do something to, to build a social security net because the levels of poverty are too high. So you got to do something to uplift people so that they don't drop below a certain level of poverty. So we instituted a very extensive system of uh, social benefits, uh, which today probably reaches, I don't know, 13, 14 million people who are dependent on public finances for, for pensions and grants of one kind or the other. Uh, it becomes a problem because uh, in the end, you've got to have an economy which produces the resources in order to be able to undertake that redistribution. But uh, no, I, it would effectually be incorrect uh, to say that uh, what happened benefited a small ruling clique and so on. It was a very massive program uh, uh, to uplift the black poor, as I'm saying, in terms of housing, in terms of access to water, infrastructure mm -hmm. development, and, and all of that. We, uh, even if we take matter of uh, communication, uh, there was a state company, a uh, telecommunications company, uh, government owned, and, but people needed telephones, not a ruling clique, ordinary people. And it was clear that, for instance, from terms of the national budget, we, we, we would not have money in order to expand that telecommunications network so that indeed ordinary people then can have access to telephones. Uh, and so what we did, we then sold part of the company to foreign investors who then brought in the resources and one of the conditions that we put to that uh, acquisition was that they would have to make sure that the telephone lines in the rural areas 
that schools and hospitals and clinics and so on, particularly in the rural areas, had this thing and so on, in order to meet this need among the people. Uh, of course, it was later overtaken by the development of cell phones. Uh, so, but the, uh, uh, but the real problem is, is again, to go back to what I was saying earlier, was the, the entrenchment of this legacy uh, of this three and, three and a half years, three and a half centuries uh, of, of, of this colonialism and apartheid. Hmm. So there may indeed have been expe an expectation that we could move faster with regard to the resolution of these matters. Take the issue of uh, uh, unemployment remains a major problem to this day. And part of the problem with, with it is a, a level of skills. Again, because during the apartheid years, as I was saying earlier, you had a deliberate policy, uh, in, in fact, to undereducate the African majority. So as the economy changes, so it's OK. Well, not, not OK. <laughs> but, uh, during a, an earlier period when uh, you had a lot of labor-intensive uh, things. Um, sure, then people could find jobs when you go and construct a road, you find people with picks and shovels and so on. But things change. Uh, you've got modern ways of building roads and so on. Now you, you need a skilled person who's going to be able to drive this roller and whatever equipment that you use for road building. But the people don't have skills because they were denied the skills. So, so what have you got to do? You've got to make sure that you improve the skills level in the society to produce the sorts of skills that are required by the economy. It took longer than we thought it would. So, and it persists to this day. So that there's a high level of unemployment and a critical answer to that question is, is to make these people employable. And to make, to make them employable means training. Capacity building. It means capacity building. Otherwise, they are there. Uh, the human resource is there. But it's not qualified uh, in terms of what is required by economy and society. So I'm saying that, uh, you see, you, you, maybe there was then an expectation that we would move faster with regard to dealing with that issue of unemployment. But in fact, we haven't moved as fast as that expectation would have been. But it would be incorrect to say that because of that, it was because we were busy uh, ensuring that uh, only a small ruling clique gets the benefits of, of liberation. That would not be correct. Thank you for watching part one of our conversation with uh, President Tabombeki. Please tune in for our next episode where President Becky Father highlight challenges that African leader experiences today. On behalf of Ongoz Institute, thank you for watching and have a good evening.